every one of you watching this screen, look out. Because soon, very soon, the most horrifying monster menace ever conceived will be oozing into this theater. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where I dig through old editions past of Dungeons and Dragons for the forgotten gems left behind for you to use in your 5th edition game. Today's episode is a very special one and one that I've wanted to do for a really long time. After all, no dungeon would truly be complete without all the sludge puddles and slimes that creep through every crack and crevice. The ooze has been a big part of Dungeons and Dragons since the very beginning and if you ask anyone, almost every player has a story about an ooze encounter. They come in all shapes and sizes and some of them can be particularly nasty. There are a few different reasons why many seasoned adventurers won't enter the dungeon without their 10 foot pole and the ooze is definitely one of those reasons. Today we're going to be talking about some of the less common, well known and more unique oozes and hopefully they'll give you inspiration and ideas to make your players poke every pool of liquid they find with a stick. The first creature on our list is the Bloodfire Ooze. This creature comes to us from 3rd edition's Monster Manual 2. The Bloodfire Ooze, as its name might suggest, appears as a puddle of thick blood, occasionally manifesting faces and other gross things on the surface of its body. This creature literally boils as it creeps along the ground, reeking of brimstone and blood, and for good reason. See, in order to actually create one of these things, you have to mix like a crazy amount of boiling blood from neutral or good living creatures. I think it's like a hundred different creatures. You have to combine that with the essence of one of the denizens of the lower planes. Now getting this amount of blood and a demon's essence isn't something that just anyone can do. However, if a vile creature is willing to go through with this ritual, the payoff is a bloodfire ooze that will obey your commands. As long as they're simple enough for it to understand, of course. So, why would someone want to even have one of these things around? Well, the main benefit to creating a bloodfire ooze is that all fire spells cast within 60 feet of it are empowered, like a lot. So, an evil fire-based being, such as an Afridi for example, or maybe a red mage even, might seek to create one of these things to augment its own powers. Mechanically what this means is anytime you cast a fire spell in that radius, like fireball for example, all the damage dice are raised by one tier, so if it does d6s, you're now rolling d8s instead. Also, any fire spells that would cause the target to make a save of any kind imposes disadvantage on the target. This alone is usually enough reason to keep one of these things around for certain fire types. However, as a combatant, it's no pushover either. The mere touch of this ooze causes terrible burns, meaning that not only is it going to cause burning damage when it attacks, but any creature that touches it or strikes it with a melee weapon is also going to be subject to that fire damage. And hopefully your players like being burned alive, because that's just the first of its many combat tricks. It can also unleash a torrent of caustic burning blood that causes all creatures within 10 feet of it to make a dexterity save. Anyone who fails that save, of course, is going to take the full brunt of the attack, resulting in a really high amount of damage. And of course, even if the save is successful, taking half damage from this attack is still going to be significant. Its final combat maneuver, however, is a bit more on the defensive side. The Bloodfire Ooze is capable of twisting and forming its body into just horrid shapes that are even more horrid than its regular form, if you can imagine that. As such, it can force one targeted creature to make a wisdom save, and if it fails, that creature has disadvantage on its next attack roll against the Ooze. Abilities like this can turn a sure victory into a bit more of a dicey situation, but as it can only target one creature at a time, it's most likely going to target whoever or whatever is doing the most damage to it. That said though, you are definitely going to get the most out of this creature when you use it as a supplement to a more powerful fire creature. Any boss monster that can cast fire spells is going to be made a lot more difficult and more interesting by incorporating the Bloodfire Ooze into the mix. For something less intense though, you could always just throw one of these into a dungeon. Instead of using a black slime or a grey ooze or any of the other slimes that you find in the monster manual, you could just as easily put one of these guys in there for a little variety. I guess that's kind of the theme of today's episode is just variety, because they're all oozes but each of them are a little different. But in this case, say the players find some kind of weird cauldron filled with boiling red liquid. You can describe the scent of burning brimstone and blood as they enter the chamber. At the end of the day, it's still just an ooze encounter with a couple extra abilities, but it adds a very different feel to this dungeon. And I think that's what I like about oozes so much, is they really just build the atmosphere. Even your basic oozes aren't necessarily all that challenging, although in the right situation, I've seen them outright kill players at lower levels. 
but that aside. The oozes just do such a good job of building up the atmosphere in your dungeon as this decrepit place where monsters have domain. The next slimy pseudopod on our list is the Death Reap Ooze, and unlike most monsters you're probably familiar with, it doesn't actually come from one of the monster manuals or other core source books. In fact, the Death Reap Ooze comes exclusively from the 3rd edition adventure Expedition to Castle Ravenloft. As you would probably expect from any creature that resides in an ancient vampire's castle, it has some pretty peculiar abilities. It's very clear in the context of the adventure that the Death Reap Ooze is the result of some necrotic experiment. However, the neat thing about plucking a monster from a module and just placing it in our game is that we now have to come up with our own backstory as to why it was created. You could simply replicate the implied origin from the module in that it was created by some necromantic magic, or perhaps it spontaneously came to be as a result of an ooze that spent too long in a corrupted magical area. Or you could simply just leave it unexplained, you don't necessarily have to come up with an origin story if you don't want to, but the one thing to keep in mind here is that theme of necrotic energy and undeath, and you'll see why in a moment. The body of this ooze is absolutely infused with evil magic, and as a result, rather than doing acid damage like most other oozes when it strikes or is struck, it instead deals necrotic damage. Necrotic damage can be good for getting past some resistances, but also if the party sees an ooze and assumes the damage is going to be acidic, they may end up making some false preparations in advance. In addition to simply switching up the damage type, it can also unleash a negative energy burst that affects all creatures around it within a 10 foot radius. Sound familiar? This is really handy though when the ooze gets to grab someone, because when all the other players rush in to save their friend, it then unleashes this negative energy blast which will hit everyone. I feel like one of the most common ways we see wizards differentiate on the ooze is to simply give it an AoE attack, which I don't think is a bad thing. Most mid-level creatures should have an attack that affects everything in a radius around it, or some other kind of crowd control. But it's just interesting to see that pattern across all the different oozes that I've looked at in doing research for this video. I think it really raises the question as to how do you make an ooze more interesting? I mean, aside from grab people and pull it into their form and giving it an AoE attack, there's only so many things you can do. However, the Death Reap Ooze is unique in that it has another ability that is really what makes it just awesome. It's called Retrieve the Fallen, and the way this ability works is that if a creature is dropped to zero hit points and has to start making death saving throws, or is outright killed within reach of the ooze, it can pull the body into its form. Doing this does provoke an attack of opportunity, however, for many creatures that are within range. But the great thing about oozes is it's not like it's going to strategically think to do that, it just does. If the creature is not dead already and they're simply making death saving throws, they get one failure as soon as this happens, and then another failure at the beginning of each of the ooze's turns, so it's very likely they'll be able to get out of this if their friends don't come in and help them. If the creature does die, or it's already dead when the ooze pulls it in, it is subject to the other half of this ability, which is called Engender Undead. What happens here is that the ooze infuses the corpse with necrotic energy, and one minute later, that corpse rises as an undead creature. To determine what undead creature is created, there's actually a table, which I've included in the conversion of course, where you roll a d12 and there's several different options that you can get as to what is spawned. This table includes stuff like shadows, mummies, straight up zombies, you name it. But if there's anything not on the table you think should be on there, or something on the table that you don't feel really fits, feel free to switch it up in any way, there's no real wrong answers here. Something else to take note of regarding this ability is that a necromancer can actively direct what is summoned by the ooze. So if you're using the death reap ooze as an auxiliary unit to a necromancer encounter, or maybe it's even one of your players who's doing this, the necromancer does have say in what is actually created. Of course, if the ooze is given no direction by the necromancer, it's just going to make whatever it feels like. And given that the ooze just simply has to be fed bodies to continue spitting out undead, I could totally see a young, enterprising necromancer taking full advantage of a death reap ooze if he was able to attain one. Perhaps he's kidnapping people from town or sending his undead minions to raid merchants as they pass by on the road. Whatever he's doing, maybe this necromancer is just out finding fuel for his death reap ooze mummy making machine. All he really has to do is keep the ooze in a vat, return to his lair with fresh bodies, and just dump them in. Overall, I think the Death Reap Ooze is a great choice for an encounter in an area where undead are the focus. And by having one of these things stored in a vat in the necromancer's lair is just going to add a whole other element to combat and really make your players just say, what is that? 
which is always a good thing. Well, maybe not always, but most of the time that's a good thing. On to the third monster we have to talk about today though, which is called the Skitter Hunt. This unique ooze actually comes to us from an article that was posted on the Wizards official D&D page back in 2002. So if you ever doubt how much research I really put into making these videos, that should give you a little bit of a clue. So the main idea of the Skitter Haunt is that it's a parasitic ooze that feeds on vermin with exoskeletons like spiders or scorpions. At first glance in the dungeon, it may appear to just be a giant spider or a centipede. But upon closer inspection, it seems to be leaking fluid from some of the joints and its eyes. Maybe it's moving a lot slower than you'd expect something like this too. It's not skittering around, it's just kind of sluggishly trotting along. Essentially, what's going on here is the skitter haunt has totally taken over the host body of the vermin, just absolutely melting out its guts and taking over its form. It essentially becomes the creature it's infesting, and as such can use its bite attack or any other natural claws it might have. However, due to the fact that it's all but liquefied everything within the monster's shell, it can't do anything fancy like spin webs if it's inside of a spider, or create venom if it's inside of a scorpion. There is a template for creating a skitter haunt if you want to apply this idea to creating some other kind of creature, but for the most part the base stats for a giant spider that's infested by one of these things is going to be sufficient. However, I will leave that in the conversion document if say you want to make a mega spider or some crazy creature that I'm not even thinking of off the top of my head right now into a skitter haunt. Moving on though, you're probably wondering what else it can do aside from the basic physical abilities of the creature it's infesting. And the answer to that question is it can spray acid. Lots and lots of acid. The Skitter Haunt gets an attack that allows it to shoot caustic liquid through the cracks in its chitinous armor. It can only target one creature at a time though, but it can target them up to 120 feet away, and if this attack connects, that creature is going to take a ton of melty, horrible acid damage. Now the one thing the Skitter Haunt does give up here is the ability to pull creatures into its form like most gelatinous creatures do. However, what it gains for that drawback is the element of surprise. Throwing a Skitter Haunt into a dungeon that is populated mostly by, say, giant spiders can be a great way to catch your players off guard, but also give them a more challenging encounter. I find doing this can really help break up the monotony that some DMs run into when playing the game at the lower levels. A really great way to play this off though is if you make them fight a few giant spiders beforehand, maybe over a couple of different rooms even. So by the time they get to the third room and there's just more giant spiders, they're like, oh whatever, I go up and attack it. And it's like, oh, surprise, he sprays acid in your face. Whoops. Aside from that though, it's just another low level monster and we can never get enough of those. And I mean, it just adds, again, we keep on saying this, but the atmosphere of the dungeon. It just seems cool that there would be a parasitic ooze that would take over something with an exoskeleton. I mean, if you want to do something really gross, you could even make a version of this that's taken over some kind of humanoid creature and is just slowly melting it away from the inside since humans don't have exoskeletons. So maybe they come across an old adventuring party that is now mostly just goop. But I will leave all of those brutal and disgusting ideas to you guys and let me know how your players receive them if you choose to go down that route. Now for the last entry in today's episode, we've actually got a creature from Pathfinder. And like its name would imply, the Hungry Fog is a big cloud of acidic fog and he is very hungry. It roams the halls of old forgotten dungeons, basically looking to devour any living matter it can get its hands on. Or gaseous form on in this case. That probably sounds a little similar to the classic gelatinous cube, right? Now the biggest difference between the Hungry Fog and your classic cube of jello is that it can slip between all the cracks and holes, under doors, between floorboards, you name it. This in turn makes it a lot harder to get away from, a lot harder to catch, and therefore a lot more dangerous. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that the players have been locked inside of a room designed to trap them and keep them there. No big deal of course, these rooms are in all kinds of dungeons, they just have to wait for the rogue to pick the lock to the door and then they can get out, right? But what if I told you that the green mist leaking in through the crack under the door is actually a hungry creature that wants to devour them, armor and all. This might encourage the rogue to speed it up a little bit with a lock picking. However terrifying this ability is though, it does come with a bit of a trade-off. For starters, it can't actually enter water or any other liquid, so if the PCs go into a room that involves going underwater, the hungry fog will remain hungry, at least for the time being. The other drawback is that it makes the creature very susceptible to wind and spells that create wind. Since its body is literally made of gas, the slightest weakest wind spell is enough to totally disperse the thing. But as with most creatures that are gaseous, the players will need some kind of magic to take it out. 
because without magic, you're basically just swinging your sword or hammer through some thick air. The other thing to consider here is that as a gas, it can't grab people and pull them into its form. However, it can easily move over top of other creatures without having to make any checks or do anything. And if it does envelop a creature like this, the person inside the fog has disadvantage on attack rolls, ability checks, and saves. Talk about debilitating. All of these abilities really make the Hungry Fog excellent as a resource for enemies. So say you have some kobolds or goblins that are hiding within the walls and they know that the fog is going to do all this crazy stuff for the party when it's upon them, they might just wait in ambush and as soon as they realize the fog is on the party, then they start attacking. The only actual way the fog is going to cause damage itself though is with its necrotic energy attack. It can cause some pretty decent damage overall despite how low of a CR this creature is, but that's not the craziest thing about it. The most messed up thing about the Hungry Fog is how it actually lures victims to it. The Hungry Fog, as it roams the halls of the dungeon, will try to manifest forms inside of its body to lure adventurers closer. Maybe from down the hall you think you can make out the silhouette of a lost knight holding a lantern. Or perhaps it even looks like a party member who's been separated from the group beckoning you forward. Once you get close enough to realize it's a mere illusion, however, it's too late. The creature descends upon you, and not only does it get a surprise round to make some attacks, you also have to make a wisdom saving throw or be frightened of it for the next round. Not a bad way for the monster to start out combat. Now the one common theme with all of these oozes, and I would say most oozes in general, is that pretty much any one of them can just be fit into almost any dungeon. Sure there are some that might thematically fit more with one dungeon or another, and I would encourage you to pursue that, but at the end of the day, a dungeon is where the ooze thrives, and any of these different monsters can be a really fun and exciting challenge for your players, if used in the right circumstance. Maybe you like the idea of unleashing a hungry fog on your players, but they're too low level, so some skitter haunts will do instead. Plus, it will make the ranger in your group who took ooze as their favorite enemy feel great about themselves for once. Now before we wrap things up here, I do have a couple honorable mentions that didn't make the list for this episode anyways. The first one here we have is the ooze drake, which I think is really cool design wise, but at the end of the day, it's basically just a sticky drake that breathes acid instead of fire. I didn't think it was worth digging into too much, because if you do really like that idea, just take a drake, change its breath attack to acid, and you're done. The only other ability I think it got was the ability to go through water quickly, which at the end of the day isn't going to be a huge advantage, but something to consider. The other one is called the Glitter Fire Ooze, which functions basically like most oozes, except it can cast Glitter Dust and also Fireball. I just liked the idea of a glittery flaming ooze, and I mean maybe if you're running a 4th of July themed game this would be appropriate, but other than that, it's essentially just an ooze that can cast a couple extra spells. So hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about these oozes and slimes and fogs apparently today. Um, I know there are a lot more oozes out there, I mean trust me I've seen pretty much all of them in doing research for this video, so maybe we'll do a part 2 ooze-tacular at some point. But for now, that's all I've got on oozes for you today. If you did enjoy the video, please consider subscribing to the channel, I have at least one new video every week, and make sure you tell all your friends. Nothing brings people together like a barely sentient slime, am I right? Anyways, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I will see you next week.